orders come through to dig in. We are situated immediately in front of a United States artillery fire position, which could make life difficult for us. Even though we are delighted with the grown-over hedges of our location, it is damned hard work to dig foxholes in the roots. Even before we are finished, the Americans begin their counter-attack, supported by five tanks. It is exactly 7.25pm. With concentrated fire from our weapons, we stop the counter-attack, the breakthrough point is sealed, and the enemy is forced back. Two United States tanks are now smoking ruins on the landscape. A dead American bends out of the turret tower. This day has cost the enemy considerably in the high losses of men and materiel. As so often, today has shown once again what a well-trained and properly led troop can do against an enemy with superior materiel. I am proud to belong to this troop. July 1944 After a careful shave and bath in an old wood barrel, I eat breakfast about nine o'clock. Today I feel especially well. A brief examination of our weapons and a few cheerful words to my comrades, and I am on my way to the observation post to relieve Herman. I take the shorter course across the cow pasture. The area to the left of the battalion is under enemy mortar fire. I should hurry to the observation post, but it is such a beautiful day that I find great joy in my walk across the meadow. Around the meadow, the engineer platoon is preparing some small jokes for the Americans in the form of stumble wire connected with explosive mines and hand grenades skillfully placed without their pins. I remember ten days ago when they mounted a light pressure mine under the toilet seat of a latrine near a French farmhouse that we could no longer defend. I imagine with satanic pleasure how an American sat down comfortably on the seat only to have the mine blow both him and the stinking outhouse to heaven but this treachery is a weapon against both enemy and friend. Suddenly, not five steps away from me, a grey-black mushroom erupts in which a fiery Satan bellows and spits glowing beams from all sides. Even before the sound and pressure waves reach my ears, I lie down in an old shell crater, holding the steel helmet on my head as clods and rocks fall on and around me. Then I feel a hot burning in my left foot. With horror, I observe a long tear in my left boot that reaches from the ankle to the toes. The pain increases. With difficulty, I try to remove the boot from my foot, but it causes terrible pain. Determined, I take my knife and cut the upper boot from the top to where the tear begins. Finally, I succeed in freeing the wounded foot from the boot and pull off the sock. I look at the damage, which at first glance does not look too serious. One toe is split open from the root to the toenail like by a hatchet. The blood gushes blue-red from the wound, soaking my entire foot. Calmly I stick a cigarette between my lips. Let the red sap of life continue to flow, cleaning the wound, and prepare the bandage. Where are you hit? an artillery man asks abruptly, standing at the rim of the crater and staring at my wounded foot. You see for yourself, my friend. Come down and help me bandage my foot if you don't have anything more important to do. I wave to him. I am supposed to be scouting the destruction, but I think you need help, he utters, as he kneels next to me with the bandage. In the meantime, the whole foot has swollen. Lightly shaking, I am forced to lie on my back. So, says the man, the campaign is over for you. Whom can I inform? Just go straight north 200 metres, and there you will find Sergeant Herman in his observation post. He can send me to Moella, I inform him, and nod my thanks in addition. I take the splinter, which is about the size of a nickel, out of my boot sole, and play with it in my hands. What have you done? Mola asks, interrupting my thoughts. Why didn't you take the passageway? Now we are sitting in hot grease, and you are going to lie down in a white bed. Shut your mouth, what is this nonsense about a stretcher? I scold him and the medic standing behind him. Try it first before I go. Angrily I stand on my legs, but the toes hurt so much that I come to my senses. So there, grins the medic. Now be nice and tame and lie on the stretcher. Carefully they carry their angry load out of the crater and a short time later reach the fire station where the battalion doctor has already arrived. It finally got you, he says, and loosens the bandage. Only partly, I respond, 
although every time he touches me it causes strong pain. Yes, my dear, the toe, including the nail, has been split and damaged the bone. It will take several weeks before you are in order again. You will have to be transported to the main aid station. While the medic bandages my wound again, I frantically consider how I can get away from these quacks as the doctor fills out a red-rimmed form and hangs it on my infantry insignia. It looks quite nice next to the insignia, he grins. What does this mean? I ask furiously. You don't think I will just leave my men sitting here? Yes, you can't even walk, or do you want them to have to carry you around? One of your men can take a bicycle and you sit on the front and report to the regiment first aid station. That is an order. I will call your company leader so that he can send a replacement for you, he instructs, businesslike. My eyes wander around, looking into the solemn faces of my comrades. I feel like vomiting. Herman will take over the platoon for the time being. I arouse myself finally. Here is my pistol, the maps, the binoculars and the compass, I say, turning to the battery sergeant. Muller, bring my shaving kit, fill my canteen full of Calvados and get your bicycle. Don't you guys worry about me? Do for Herman what you did for me, and in the meantime, I will see if I can't stay close by. Perplexed, some of them wipe their noses and others rub their moist eyes. Did you eat onions? I ask, forcing a laugh to save the situation. With all my energy, I suppress my own feelings that now bring to my consciousness just what these men mean to me. Merla goes down the hill quickly but carefully. The road is torn up by Grenadies, and it requires his whole skill and attention. Thirty minutes later, I am in the hands of a competent physician. It is just enough to send you home, he says, and gives orders to bandage me again. Couldn't I let it heal while I stay here? I ask. Nonsense. The bone is gone. You have to go to the main aid station, and a truck is just about ready to leave. He remains hard-hearted. I would still rather stay with the troops, I demand. You don't hear very well, Sergeant. Or do you believe I will let you stay, so that in a couple of days I will have to saw off your leg at the knee? Do what I tell you. The war is not yet over. You will still have your share of it in case you have not had enough already. Tetanus he says to a medic, and is already busy with somebody else. Submitting to my fate, I turn my bear behind toward the medic and the syringe. The needle penetrates my flesh and brings into my body the protection against tetanus. Shortly afterward, I stand on one leg in front of the ambulance and hold Moella's hand tightly in mine. So, Moella, thanks for everything. Say hello to the comrades and now go to Lieutenant Luettin. Tell him of my misfortune and that I will write him from the hospital as soon as possible. See that you all keep well so that I can rejoin you. Come back to us again. I struggle, still pressing my hand until the medic is forced to separate us. Shaken, I understand once again the deepest meaning of the word comrade. The medic drives quickly to the main aid station. The well-known ritual begins. Bandage off, bandage on, fit for transport. Couldn't I stay here for a few days until the wound reacts? I ask the doctor after I have been taken care of. Listen, he considers my request somewhat amazed. I don't hear that question very often. But do you believe we would transfer you if it were not necessary? We have to look at the wounds very carefully. Some don't have any. Just yesterday someone arrived here with a fine bandage. His arm was completely wrapped in bandages, and you could see the blood that had seeped through a hundred yards away. I thought to myself, he must have a hole as big as a grenade, but he didn't go through my station. By chance, I saw him get on the bus. The bandage had not been changed, and that caused me to pull him out of the bus. He protested strenuously. We called the military police, unwrapped the bandage, and found no wound. I tell you this so that you know it is not so easy to get away from here, but you cannot run or walk in difficult circumstances, and then we will need the vehicles for the serious cases. We know that in the next few days, the Americans will mount an offensive from their bridgehead, and we have orders to send away all the helpless. Sleep now. Your bus leaves early in the morning. July 1944. At seven o'clock, the bus with its war-scarred load, rolls southward from the main dressing station. 
a medic with a snow-white jacket and strongly oiled hair, sits next to the driver and is our only escort. The mood is very good because most are very glad to be out of the mess. In front of me, an SS corporal tells about the combat of his division. His right arm is in a bandage with wiring, which we front soldiers call simply Stuka, because it looks very similar to the wing of the Junkers 87 airplane. He boasts of how his unit made pigs of the American tanks, and I wait for him to announce that he has personally eaten a Sherman tank. In time we learn that he belongs to the SS division Goetz von Berlichingen, which is generally known as the Kiss My Ass division, and of whose bravery no one has any doubt. But I let him speak without giving him any more attention, attributing it all to his youth and first experience in battle. Silent and withdrawn, I sit on the green upholstered seat of the bus which is fleeing this hell. My thoughts are with the fifty-five men who I was forced to leave. What will happen when the Americans actually start their long-anticipated attempt to break through? Will the thin German lines hold? What kind of a way to conduct the war is it when no complete division can be sent into battle and only single isolated battalions are sent out in front of the enemy artillery? It is impossible that the German high command was so surprised by the enemy that they simply threw units against the enemy to be squashed in a few hours through the meat grinder of a determined opponent. Something is rotten about this affair and gives the current rumours about the high-ranking deserters and traitors a sense of legitimacy. But why brood over such things which one cannot change and over which he has absolutely no influence? I force the troubling thoughts out of my head and look into the summer landscape while the bus, marked by Red Cross flags, pushes toward of ranches under swarms of enemy aircraft. About one o'clock we leave of ranches and three hours later we arrive without incident in front of the cathedral in Alençon where we are provided with food and drink and find overnight accommodations in a chapel. July 1944 Three Paris buses stand in the courtyard of the good nuns who, without any consideration of persons, follow their self-chosen life-work of service. They have made our night's stay as comfortable as possible. Like me, the wounded of this new theatre of war wait impatiently before the opened doors of the buses. The doctors and medics strictly control the papers, identification tags and transport slips, which only an hour ago they filled out themselves. Within a few minutes it is obvious why such strict control is considered necessary. There are indeed German soldiers who seek to put as much distance as they can between themselves and the front. Fools, I think, now they will be court-martialed, given a warning, and their chances to survive with their lives are lessened while the hardships are at least tripled. Finally, the doors to the fully occupied buses close. Be good, the medics wave to us and the column rattles out of the courtyard. The way out of Alencon follows over the Sarthe toward Mamère, Belém and nogent le rotrou where we make a brief stop to refresh ourselves. But the wheels of the mighty organisation of the German Red Cross drive us onward and bring us into Chartres just before dark. As night breaks, I lie freshly bandaged, washed and cared for in a bed intended for wounded who are in transit. July 1944 About ten o'clock we arrive in Paris unharmed. Reserve Hospital stands over the entrance to a building near the North train station. We enter and are received by German medical personnel. Quickly we are sorted and distributed to the individual stations. Before an hour has passed, I lie washed and freshly bandaged in new pyjamas in a white covered bed in a nice private room. My wristwatch indicates it is 1 Nark p.m. as a young girl opens the door and brings me back to consciousness. Mr. Sergeant, your dinner, she says, observing me curiously. It is unbelievable how fast life for a soldier in war can change, I reflect, while the young lady brings my food. The French girl serves me meat soup, noodles, salad and goulash. I eat quickly and then end the wonderful meal with a swig of Calvados from my canteen, which Mola filled for my departure. Once again my thoughts return to the front. Why has fate been so openly generous to me, I ask myself, 
and a dull fear comes over me that one day I will have to pay for it. It is hard to comprehend that I came out of that fury with only a scratch, but finally I am not the only one whom the gods of war may have saved for later. At 3 pouch p.m. The doctor makes his rounds and tells me that on July 6th the Americans attacked and broke through our lines at several points. Even here the war still has me in its clutches. Alone once again, I see in spirit my brave comrades, how they hop from one hole to another and contend for their lives. Although the doctor spoke about only a few breakthroughs, I am still convinced that the 101st American Paratrooper Division landed in the middle of our position and that the thinly held line by La Haye du Puis came under heavy attack. At the moment I do not know what is stronger in me, the joy that I am here in safety, or the oppressive fear for my comrades and the eventual success of the Americans. July 1944 Without asking if I am willing to leave, two French girls stand at the foot of my bed and hold fast to their demands. Everyday life in the hospital begins. Reluctantly, I relinquish my territory to the two souls bent on cleaning and hop to the door. Directly across the hall, the door is open. A man without a shirt, on whose left shoulder a bandage is taped, stands at the wash basin, soaping himself. Good morning, he says, friendly. Staff Sergeant Boger is my name. Where did you get hit? he asks, after I have introduced myself. Up by Saint Sauveur. He answers and blows a mighty cloud of smoke toward the ceiling. I came out of that area too. I was with the 91st Air Landing Division, he lets me know, while he waits excitedly for my reaction. I know that bunch, a brave division. About the 12th or 14th of June, we partly relieved you up there. Then you are from the 77th Grenadier Division, he interjects quickly. That's exactly right. Half excitedly over this accidental encounter. Come, we have to drink to that. The women are finally finished with my room. He takes me by the arm and pulls me into his room. Man alive, the Americans jumped directly from the sky into our positions. I can only say that was quite a racket. He continues with the theme after we take seats on the bed, and he gets a bottle of cognac and two wine glasses from the nightstand and fills them. Isn't that a little bit too much so early in the morning? I toast him. It tastes better than the so-called coffee, he indicates, smacking his tongue. When did they get you? he asks after another healthy gulp that empties half the glass. On the 4th of July near La Haye du Puits, I say, becoming more serious. That is only three days ago. What has been going on since the 19th of June? he asks urgently. It was not too wild. When we arrived, the Americans were quite impertinent, but we quickly tamed them. The worst were the damn fighter planes and the heavy artillery. Naturally, they pushed us nearly every morning at the closed positions, so that about eleven o'clock a counter-attack from us was necessary. Contrary to the Russians, the Americans avoided any night fighting, which made our action considerably easier. I explain in a few words what was happening at the front. That's about the way they were with us after they established a foothold. But the first days were wild, and they had to fight bitterly for every foot of ground. The devil knows how it was possible that they could take Cherbourg. He throws out the question which for all of us remains a riddle. There was certainly something rotten about it, is my opinion. It could not be anything else, because I know the fortress well enough to understand what it would have cost the enemy if the preparations for defence had been serious. Instead, the bastion fell silently, to our horror, on June 27. No, it was actually the 26th. He corrects himself and I concur. Drink your glass empty, the coffee will soon be here and we can talk later, he says as we hear the clatter outside in the hall, and I hop out of the room and crawl into the freshly made bed. After drinking the coffee, the cognac that I enjoyed presses me into the pillows for an hour. But at ten o'clock, the doctor stands at my bed with his secretary and an old nurse who takes my pulse. Everything okay? he asks as I open my eyes. Thank you, doctor. I feel quite well, is my friendly answer. Leave the alcohol alone. It will lead to nothing. 
If you are still too nervous to sleep, I will be happy to give you a sleeping pill, he counsels in a fatherly tone. I met a comrade this morning who was in the same sector as me, and we had to drink to that, I excuse myself, as it is immediately clear to me that the doctor has a sharp nose. So, it is Boga across the hall, he asks with an understanding smile. Yes, doctor, I confirm. He likes to drink even without a reason. It may be a habit from Normandy. He nods to me and raises his index finger in warning. Presumably we can heal you here. He changes the subject. Tomorrow I will look at the toes. I appreciate that, doctor, I say thankfully. First rest completely, and then we will see what to do. He gives me his hand and leaves the room with the others. I reach for the remaining American cigarettes and watch the blue circles after the first little clouds hang in the room. Oh, what bad air you have. A French girl named Jeannette disturbs my beginning thoughts. Quickly she closes the door and tears open the window. Always smoking and drinking. All soldiers drink too much. She begins her completely unnecessary lament and plants herself in front of my bed. I brought cognac for you. If it is okay, she breathes secretly. How much does such fun cost? I wink with my left eye. Twenty marks? That is not very much for you. In the city your comrades pay more, she clumsily entices me. Why don't you sell the stuff in the city? I wonder. She does not answer, but only looks at me. She furrows her eyebrows. Her nostrils seem to inflate. Her breast swells, then sinks. Slowly I take my wallet from the night table and lay the money in her small hand. It is very hot in the room, Jeanette. Please open the door. I turn away from the situation that has become so unpleasant. She understands quickly. Insulted, she rolls the bills together, sets the bottle on the night table and rushes from the room. Certainly you are still tired. She turns back once more. Perhaps I will look in on you tomorrow. Amused and satisfied, I grin inside myself and take the oft-read letter from my wife from my bag. I think you have had bad luck, Jeanette. You are not the right one for me, and my thoughts wander back across the Rhine. After twenty minutes, the devil alcohol torments me until I am convinced that I must have a sip from the bottle. But I don't have a corkscrew. It serves you right, I mumble to myself. It is unfair to your comrade Boga to drink the bottle alone. Besides, it tastes much better when you drink with someone. With these thoughts, I slip the bottle under my coat and make my way to Boga. I nearly drop the bottle of cognac in surprise. Jeanette is lying in bed and is being comforted by Boga. Assuming that no one has yet noticed me, I seek my salvation in flight. But before I can reach the door, Boga calls to me. Slowly, you disturber of the peace, where are you going with the bottle? I thought I would disturb you, Boga. Pardon me, I stammer in my embarrassment. Nonsense, sit down, he chatters, obviously in a good mood. So, Jeanette, disappear. Tomorrow is another day. He turns to the girl and swings out of the bed. In no way embarrassed, she dresses without forgetting to put on her makeup. As our glances accidentally meet, I observe that now her eyes seem satisfied. Smiling, she shakes hands with both of us and leaves the room humming the hit song, Please Come Back. While I light a cigarette, I observe how Boga pulls the cork out of the bottle. He is the proper representative of our warrior generation. About twenty-nine years old, long brown hair, lusty black eyes, straight nose, broad sensuous mouth, and a strong energetic chin. On his field blouse, which hangs over the stool, there is next to the other orders and medals, the Iron Cross First Class. In the meantime, he has filled the glasses and hands one to me. Toast, my friend. We have to do something for our health. 9. July 1944. About 10 at a.m., a medic enters my room, puts me in a wheelchair, and takes me to the operating room where the good doctor works with his skillful hands on me. After I return to my room, I lie flat in bed until noon because the wound has become very uncomfortable. 
Still, the doctor expresses satisfaction with my condition and tells me that there are people here who put pepper and other material into their wounds in order to stay in the hospital longer. I too have noticed that it is much more pleasant here than at the front, but to use such means to try and prolong one's life seems to me to be vile and cowardly. Nevertheless, no one can escape his destiny, and what seems to be right at the time can prove to be wrong later, especially if one tries to deceive providence through crooked means. With a mighty gulp from the cognac bottle, I rinse down the dull taste and then I light a cigarette. The next few hours are taken up with writing letters, home and to the front. July 1944 At 1 p.m. I hear a discreet knock on my door and in response to my invitation, two sturdy, pretty and well-made up girls enter my room. They are helpers with the Air Force and they look wonderful in their uniforms. Smiling, they trip to my bed and extend their hands amicably, Inge from Gorlitz and Renata from Dusseldorf. They lay down a pretty bouquet of wildflowers on my night table, and in response to my invitation take a seat. In contrast to the girls, who act natural and uninhibited, I become nervous and reach for my cigarettes and offer them one. Without any restraint they accept, and soon rings of blue smoke drift comfortingly to the ceiling. They ask about the nature of my wound, and I must tell them about the front, which I do quickly with a few humorous words. As we continue our cheerful chatter, they begin to unpack their presents. A small but very tasty cake with chocolate frosting and white powdered sugar, a notebook and a silver picture frame. Soon everything is carefully organised on my night table, and my wife looks out from the new picture frame, amused at the scene. Before I always had something against girls in uniform, but now I am asking in silence for these two to forgive me. Their conduct and manner are so nice and uncomplicated. The pretty faces beam with the joy of giving. I reproach myself earnestly for my stupid prejudices. How can I thank you? I laugh, happy with this nice change. If it has brought you joy, that is thanks enough for us, Inga says modestly in a most pleasing voice. But I beg you, joy is not expression enough for what I feel, is my honest compliment as we hear a knock on the door, and Boga, pushing two girls ahead of him, enters my room. They are warmly greeted by my visitors. Gallantly he extends his hand to the women, then turns to me and competently takes my pulse. Quite high blood pressure, my boy. He shakes his head seriously, and that brings everyone to laughter. I could tear my hair out because the crazy character has embarrassed me, and no way comes to mind to extricate myself from the affair. In the meantime, his two lady visitors have found a place to sit at the foot of my bed with Boga, his arms crossed, between the two of them. And such people sacrifice their free afternoon, and here in Paris. I pick up the thread again. What is that in comparison to you men? Inga explains, almost sad. We girls will never be in the position to compensate you any more than in the most modest manner for your hardship and suffering. It is actually not as bad as you may imagine. One grows quickly into it, and even the constant danger helps one to value life more. Everyone, whether man or woman, does his duty regardless of where fate has placed him. While the conversation slowly drifts into political and military matters, Boga disappears and comes back a moment later with a bottle and glasses. So, children, he says, filling the glasses, that is enough of this fruitless theme. Let's drink to victory and not the least your graciousness. We cannot do any more for the situation at the moment. That is the most reasonable idea that I have ever heard from you. I raise my glass. After the second glass of cognac, I have the utmost pleasure listening to the long-missed chatter of the girls who discuss the shameless, cunning French women and in particular the simple-mindedness of the German soldiers. The blonde Ingeborg, who Boger brought into the room, observes... It is very hard for a respectable girl to secure the man her heart desires. If she does what he wants, then he stays away because he believes she would do it for everyone else. If she doesn't do it, then he thinks he is wasting his time. To July 1944
I get up after lunch in an unpleasant mood and soak myself at the wash basin. I am at odds with myself and wipe the foam from my face. Why should I shave if I can't leave the building? The shaving brush falls back into the basin filled with water. I have got to stop drinking. The women must stay out of my room. The radio should not blast so loudly. The wounds must finally heal. No, I should have visitors more often. There is a shortage of conversation and entertainment in this place. I should be able to go out. The noisemakers on the floor should offer better music. How are you doing today? The doctor asks to the accompaniment of all the commotion outside. When I lie down, it's all right, doctor, I answer the good man. He steps closer and looks at me. Haven't you received any mail? No, not here, I answer in a disturbed tone. Were you satisfied with yesterday's visitors? He wants to know. Thank you, I can't complain. I keep it short. Make a note to get him a cane. He turns to the secretary. I will look at the foot tomorrow. In a friendly manner, he takes my hand. Don't make any trouble for yourself. Even this will pass. Finally, I have a reason to be angry with myself. How can I act in such an impertinent way towards such a good doctor and man? Especially a man who has always approached me like a faithfully friend. Why is it that sometimes against my own will I hurt people who are dear and precious to me? He won't worry that much about me in the future for I do not deserve any better. Dinner arrives. Jeanette seems to have a chip on her shoulder. Angry? I tease her sarcastically as she serves the apple sauce. Yesterday the girls were here and today I can't do anything right, she fumes. You must not try to comfort so many, Jeanette. I try to kid her. She slams the door shut. Bon appétit. I grin maliciously to myself and in spite of it all I eat well. The joyless day comes to an end without having seen Boga. 2 of July, 1944 After breakfast I sit, clean-shaven, in the wheelchair in which the medic will transport me to the examination room. After a nurse loosens the bandage, the doctor, just as friendly as ever, inspects the wound. It is coming along all right, he says, looking up, but continue to take care of your foot so that the toe will stay intact later. You will get a cane so that you can find something to do outside of your room. He then gives instructions to rebandage my foot, paying attention to where the splinter is placed. Half an hour later, I am in my room. I have come this far. I can walk with a cane. Distrustful, I squint toward the club that the medic has so matter-of-fact hung on my bed. As I do so, I recall the story of a man at home who, because of a wound he suffered during the First World War, received a pension and was always seen with his cane until a new law took away the pension. He then threw the cane away, declaring to the amusement of his friends that if he did not receive a pension any longer, then he had no more use for the cane. From that hour on he was never seen again with that companion of so many years. Shortly before 2pm I wander over to Boga. I have not seen him for a while and find him polishing his boots by the window. He grins unashamedly. Today I am going into the city, he says proudly, and spits on his boots to bring out the high shine. My, my, I laugh, the bordellos will be happy to see a stallion like you. Rubbish, he contradicts. I am not one for those stinking booths. Do I look like someone who would have to pay for it? Calm yourself, where are you going? I probe deeper. That's the problem, he screams indignantly. I don't know my way around this damn nest. If I had known it yesterday, then one of the Air Force girls could be my tour guide. The best thing for you to do is to go to where the girls live and have them darn your socks. That is something that awakens their wifely feelings, and if you already have your boots off. Keep your mouth shut, he interrupts me. The devil doesn't even know where they live. How long have you been a soldier, Boga? I wink at him. What has that got to do with it? He roars. Because you don't even know that in a military establishment all visitors must leave their names and addresses with the guards, I instruct him. A radiant smile appears on his face as if by magic. Suddenly he is in a hurry. The rest of the evening I spend in the company of two bottles of beer bringing my diary up to date. At 10.12pm at lights out, Boga still has not returned. 
July 1944 First thing in the morning I look in on Boga. The stench of sour alcohol in his room nearly takes my breath away. Quickly I open the window and observe the unconscious sleeper lying with his mouth open on the bed. A nurse earning a thermometer in a glass softly enters the room. You are visiting so early? She is startled and glances in amazement around the room where Boga's boots, pants, shirt, jacket, cap and belt are scattered all over. Irritated, she puts her hands on her hips. Just look at this. That's the way men are without women. I like if someone who would at least pull down the blanket and put his naked behind in the bed. Angrily, she picks up the things and puts them on the chair according to regulations. No longer interested in Boga's temperature, she turns to the door and hisses to me. Please leave the window open. It stinks worse in here than a bar in the Rhineland the day after Mardi Gras. I discover in the wash basin a beautifully labelled bottle of Calvados, still corked. Quickly I step to the window to give the bottle a thorough examination. Yes, yes, take a good look at it, says Boga unexpectedly from his bed. It belongs to you, Helmut. I finally talked an old bartender into letting me have it. Then I had to defend the bottle from the Paris hookers with more difficulty than my machine gun position at Stalingrad. I will take a bath to wash away last night's sins, and I will excuse myself to the sergeant major for being late. Really, they cannot be angry with me when I could not find my way back in this foreign and blacked-out Paris. About noon, Boga returns from the administration office somewhat depressed. My pass is now with the chief doctor, he says. That could be bad, Boga. Can't the chief just let the whole matter fall through the cracks? I ask, with an unpleasant feeling in my stomach. It is too late for that. I should have gone in sooner, he says, apathetic. Try to talk to the head doctor. Perhaps he will take care of the matter, I counsel him. Oh, shit. They can do what they want. They will anyway, he answers, brushing it off. From late afternoon on we play cards and do not end the stupid game until the lights are turned out. July 1944 Two days have passed without anything meaningful happening. Today, at 11.20am, Boga comes back from the doctor in charge, to whom he had to report for questioning. I have been anxious all morning about how the situation regarding his furlough will turn out. As Boga crosses the threshold and comes toward me, no words are necessary. The expression on his face indicates that he will be punished. You must open the Calvados helmet. I need it very much to get the bad taste out of my mouth. After that, I will pack my things. I must report to the personnel office today for assignment to the front, he says, rather depressed and sits on the edge of my bed. What happened, Boga? I ask although I'm in no way surprised with the outcome since I went through the same kind of thing in my earlier days. Not much, he answers with a subdued voice. Everything followed its normal course. Instead of returning at 10 at p.m., we did not trundle in until 1.50 a.m. The guard, according to his orders, noted the time, and the rest you can imagine. You know how these chamber pot swingers are, and how they use their diagnoses or whatever they call the pile of shit. So, with regard to me, I am considered healthy. At three or mouse p.m., I can sign out. He ends his report and tips a double shot of Calvados down his throat. A toast to you, Carl, I give him in response. You know I had always thought that we would inhale these drops on an especially nice occasion, and I did not know that this Calvados would be the reason for our separation. That is why it must pay the debt with death. Knowing the two of us, we will have carried out the sentence by three o'clock. We enjoy ourselves immensely, and the troubled times seem much easier to endure after the alcohol has mixed with our blood. First, I will go to the personnel office and get a 24-hour pass. Boga seems to read my thoughts. Each soldier who is in Paris for the first time can get it, he indicates with confidence. How long will this damned war go on? I ask after a pause. If it ends this year, then we are the losers. I don't want that. We have stood in the shit too long to have peace at any price, is his opinion. That's my view as well, but how can it continue? I would really like to know. 
you will have to ask Adolf that personally. As we hear, the great blow is coming soon. But I don't believe everything anymore. He fills the glasses again. These stupid rumours have been stuck in my throat for a long time. Ever since Stalingrad, they have been feeding it to us, and all the time we have been going downhill. I defend myself against the eternal propaganda rumours. That is not really so, he encourages me. Some things do have their justice. There are really weapons that are nearly finished that will give another face to the war. But when that will be, we do not know. Let's hope for the best, Boga. I raise my glass. Let's have lunch now. That's the way it shall be. He rises, slightly swaying, and goes into his room to pack. After the meal, I take the bottle and glasses and go with deep sorrow in my heart to Boga. It is always the same in the military, I think, as I cross the hall. One gets to know comrades that he likes and then loses them. You come as though I called for you. Boga receives me. I have just finished. I don't feel very good in my skin when I see you in your war paint. Me neither. But let's not talk about it. There is nothing that can be done about it, he says with resignation. Do you at least know where your group is? I ask while he fills the glasses. No, I think I can find that out in the personnel office. He hands me the glass filled with liquor from Normandy. At 2.35pm, Boga gets up and takes a cigarette out. The time is up, my friend. I must go, he says, and extends his hand. Be good, Helmut. I am happy I got to know you. Perhaps our paths will cross again in the future. Take care, Carl. Be cheerful and greet Inga for me. I wish you all the luck in the world. Perhaps we will see each other at the front. I press his hand firmly and accompany him to the door. A friend has gone from me. Dully his steps fade away on the linoleum-tiled floor. July 1944 Since Boga's departure, I have not left my room. I am reading the book, The Command of Conscience, and I have forgotten the world around me. In the middle of the night, a medic awakes me. The Führer will speak, he says, and with these four words he tears me out of my sleep and my lethargy. Now, in the middle of the night, I want to ask the man, but he has already left. Quickly I get out of bed and make my way out to the floor. Subdued march music sounds out of the loudspeaker. The wounded stand in groups around the speakers. Bits of conversation reach my ears. In the homeland, the swine are rising up, trying to stab us in the back, I hear an upset man say who wears a thick bandage around his head. The main thing is that the Führer is still alive. Another interjects. What happened? I ask as I approach a group. A plot against the Führer. Nearly everyone answers at the same time. A feeling of distress lies on my heart and the picture flashes before my eyes of Hagen as he stabbed Siegfried in the back with his spear. From the loudspeaker we hear the familiar voice of the Führer. I am speaking to you so that you can hear my voice, a handful of ambitious officers as a sign of providence. It has come this far. Now the Germans are eating each other. That is what all those strange decisions add up to since the invasion. Sold and betrayed, all the brave German soldiers stand on the fronts and fight in hopeless combat. What do you say, comrade, to this situation in the homeland? A man standing next to me asks as I turn to go. I don't understand it any more, I answer, subdued. Hopefully they will push through and finally bring the men out into the open. The man fumes and balls his hands into fists. There may be people in the general staff on whose feet Hitler has trodden, but the fact that in this hour of their country's greatest need they try to play politics, which will lead only to chaos, I will never understand. The anger hits me. They are saboteurs who have shifted the war into reverse, and now they have revealed their cards. I hear the man continue before the door to the room closes from inside. What do these officers want, who certainly have a vision of the highest war strategy? Why do they resort to undertake a plot in order to overthrow Hitler? Reason tells me there are only two possibilities. Either they intend through sabotage to bring about the inevitable defeat in order to turn the people and the army against Hitler and then seize power for themselves, or we are indeed at the end of our strength, and they are trying now to save what can be saved. But where do these rumours about secret weapons come from? 
The fact that they have already put the rockets into action is proof that there is some truth to what is said. How will things go from here on? He will fulfil his destiny in that the new weapons will be implemented and the war will come to an end sooner or later. I answer my own question, since this simple solution comes closest to fulfilling my own wish to go home. But still, I lie in bed for hours, smoking continuously, until sleep finally carries me from this miserable world. On July the 20th, 1944, at 12.42pm, a bomb exploded in the conference room at Hitler's headquarters at Rastenburg in East Prussia. The bomb had been brought into a conference room in a briefcase by Klaus Philipp Schenk, Count von Stauffenberg, a career officer in the German army and member of an old and distinguished South German family. Hitler survived the explosion because another officer had moved the briefcase behind the heavy leg of the map table. Still, Hitler was considerably shaken. One pants leg was blown off, one leg was burned, his hair was scorched, his back was bruised by a falling beam, his right arm hung stiff and useless, and both eardrums were damaged. Convinced that this was an important turn of events for Germany, Hitler would preserve his tattered uniform as a future museum piece, as evidence that Providence had indeed saved his life. This was not the first assassination attempt on Haitia's life, but it came closest to success. Count von Stauffenberg's action was part of an elaborate attempt by a group of military officers and politicians to take control of the German government and negotiate peace treaties with Germany's enemies. Upon returning to Berlin from Rastenburg, von Stauffenberg pushed ahead with the planned overthrow. However, later in the day, when it became obvious that Adolf Hitler had not been killed, other officers loyal to Hitler suppressed the attempted overthrow and shot von Stauffenberg and several other leading participants. At 12.30 that night, 12 hours after the explosion, Adolf Hitler spoke in a broadcast carried over all German radio stations. This was the speech that I and the other patients heard. If I speak to you today, it is first in order that you should hear my voice and should know that I am unhurt and well, and secondly, that you should know of a crime unparalleled in German history, a very small clique of ambitious, irresponsible and at the same time senseless and stupid officers had formed a plot to eliminate me and the high command of the armed forces. The bomb placed by Colonel Graf von Stauffenberg exploded two metres to my right. One of those with me has died. Other colleagues very dear to me were severely injured. I myself sustained only some very minor scratches, bruises and burns. I regard this as a confirmation of the task imposed upon me by Providence. The circle of these conspirators is very small and has nothing in common with the spirit of the German Wehrmacht and, above all, none with the German people. I therefore give orders, now that no military authority, no commander and no private soldier, is to obey any orders emanating from this group of usurpers. I also order that it is everyone's duty to arrest, or if they resist, to shoot at sight, anyone issuing or handling such orders. I am convinced that with the uncovering of this tiny clique of traitors and saboteurs, there has at long last been created in the rear that atmosphere which the fighting front needs. The response by me and my comrades to Hitler's speech was apparently typical of that throughout Germany. John Toland, in his biography Adolf Hitler, records... The early rumour of Hitler's death brought hysteria and tears to scores of girl telephonists. The story spread and caused consternation until the reassuring newscast brought new tears, these of joy. These expressions of relief were not completely self-serving. The great majority of Germans felt that the nation's future depended on the Führer. In subsequent days, other participants were rounded up and it is estimated that about 5,000 people were executed because of actual or alleged participation in the conspiracy. Among those actively involved in the plot were General Ludwig Beck, Gary Gordeler, former mayor of Leipzig, Field Marshal Erwin von Witzleben, and General Franz Halder. Others who knew of the plot but had done nothing to help or hinder it also lost their lives. Admiral Wilhelm Canaris was executed by a firing squad. Erwin Rommel, the popular and well-respected Desert Fox of the North Africa campaign and later the general in charge of German fortifications in France prior to the invasion, was forced to commit suicide. 
Although his death was made to appear as occurring in an automobile accident, the effect of the assassination attempt on Hitler was to increase his intense distrust of army generals while at the same time rendering his own leadership more ineffective. The shock of the explosion further weakened his ability to concentrate, while the dubious medication he took seemed to cause further physical deterioration. 22nd July 1944 While the events of the last days are anxiously discussed in the hospital, a large number of newly wounded arrive. They put a second bed in my room for a badly shot-up staff sergeant. He comes from the area around Khan and is still very numb, so that any conversation is out of the question, even though the happenings in that area are of great interest to me since my unit was stationed in Kayan until May 1944. For days the doctor has carried around a very serious face, and after his visit today a transport slip now hangs on my chart. He told me goodbye with the words, We must make room, Sergeant, keep your ears stiff. You are going to Strasbourg. I wish I was able to be transported. My neighbour finally opens his mouth. I would feel much better in Strasbourg. Here everything humanly possible is being done for you. You will not find a better doctor in Strasbourg, and the food could not be better than here. It doesn't have anything to do with that, he indicates with an earnest face. I want to get out of France. One of these days there will be no more room for us here. You must keep still and not upset yourself, comrade. One sees only black in the first few days and believes it will not be better. But things change quickly. In a week you will be dreaming of your first furlough. By the way, so that I don't forget, a couple of Air Force girls will come to this room in a few days and wonder why I am not here. Be so good and extend greetings from me. They will thank you with a very fine cake. I encourage him and organise my things in preparation for my transfer. After dinner, I stand in my freshly washed uniform at the bed of the staff sergeant and hold his hand in my right hand. Don't lose courage, I say in parting. They will put you back together and life will continue even if we on the front fail. Goodbye, thank you for your indulgence. Perhaps later we can get drunk on my pension. He smiles bravely and lifts his healthy hand in salute. Thirty minutes later, I sit in a bus that slowly takes us to the north train station. The sun burns hot on the Paris asphalt while the girls in fragrant dresses promenade along the pavement, their eyes, hidden by sunglasses, glancing at the gentlemen who sit in front of the restaurants enjoying cool drinks. But we stand once again on the edge of life and without a word of protest allow ourselves to be taken out of this beautiful city into another one where they will make our shot-up bones healthy once again so that we can be thrown back into the war. Get out. A medic orders this after the bus arrives at the train station. Twisting and moaning, the suffering people leave the upholstered seats and make their way through the nearly empty station to the platform where a Red Cross train waits to leave. Faster than one would expect from soldiers outfitted with canes and crutches, we have disappeared into the coaches. People are always driven by their desires. This time it is the pull to get a window seat. Where are they taking us now? A Saxon turns from the window and looks around. To the moon where they will shoot you if you don't soon sit on your ass. Gifts, cigarettes, chocolates and candies. Someone screams from the window and thereby interrupts the beginning skirmish. Come here with the stuff. Twelve men are in this compartment. The Saxon turns to better things, sticking his head out the window in order not to be passed over. His efforts are rewarded. Just as proud as Santa Claus, he distributes the items he has obtained without forgetting himself. But not long after complaints arise. When do you think they will leave? The eternally dissatisfied bleat. At the moment when the man with the red hat raises his green sign, a wise cracker knows the right answer and brings out the laughter. Exactly at 9 in p.m., the train rolls out of the station and into the beginning night. 23rd July 1944 As dawn comes, we stop at the Fontainebleau train station. Damn it, this is not the direct route to Strasbourg, I think but comfort myself with the immediate thought that apparently a bridge across the Marne has been destroyed and the train must take a detour. Under normal circumstances, we should at least be in Epernay, if not Chalons on the Marne. 
but all the unrest is useless. The train stands, like it had grown here in Fontainebleau, on a rusty side track and shows no sign of moving on to where the thoughts of its passengers have been for hours. Strasbourg. Flow much I look forward to this city to which I am tied by so many dear memories. I will immediately send a telegram to my wife so that she can join me. While I allow myself the anticipated joy of our reunion, the train reaches the Yon, a tributary of the Seine, and every minute brings us closer to our goal. Suddenly my thoughts are interrupted. The train stands at Auxerre and does not follow the direction toward Dijon, Mulhausen, Strasbourg as I had imagined. Along the row of cars, medics of the Waffen SS appear. Get out! the command roars. Dreadful curses fly through the compartments. But they do no good. We are soldiers and must obey. Such a damn dirty situation, bellows a joker. So close to the latrine to shit in one's pants. And once again the long-suffering men are laughing. The soldier's humour helps to overcome almost everything. A little later we sit in buses and ride into a summer calm little city. SS Hospital Auxerre stands over the entrance to a park in whose rear a long stretching building can be seen. Here we are then. I nod to a comrade who sat next to me during the train ride and who looks very serious. Endure it with humour, then it will be easier for you, I advise him as he appears now to be indifferent. What are we to do among the SS? he asks spitefully. A hospital is a hospital, regardless of what kind of insignia the people wear on their uniforms. I shrug my shoulders and go into the building. A considerable time later, I lie in blue and white striped pyjamas in the corner of a large room in a double-decker bed, and I don't know whether I should be full of anger or wonder. The hospital is filled to the ceiling. Despite the overcrowding, the noon meal consists of mutton and macaroni and as a special gesture of hospitality, an apple for dessert. The food, to the comfort of all of us, is abundant and well prepared. With a full stomach but with mixed feelings, I fall asleep in the strange surroundings with their constant disturbance. Bathed in sweat, I rise up when the whistle sounds for dinner and go to wash myself. The meal is set out on a long table. The dominating heat brings forth all kinds of undefinable odours, and as a consequence restricts the appetite considerably. After dinner I find a book in the library, from the Tsar's Eagle to the Red Flag, which I put under my arm and find a quiet place outside in order to read until bedtime. July 1944. The newly arrived wounded are given a thorough examination today. A medic stands with a list at the entrance to the hall and calls out the names of the wounded who are to present themselves to the doctor. As the first return, they report that a rough tone prevails here. At 10.30am, I sit in front of the doctor with my bandages removed while he reads my papers with interest. You are a sergeant, Horner, and were wounded in the area around La Haye du Puy, he asks me as he passes the papers to a nurse. Release him for assignment in about three weeks. He turns to a clerk and gives instructions to bandage me again, Condescendingly, he extends to me his hand and his glance forces me to look at him. Nearly half the people in this transport are nearly healed. Do you have an explanation for that? The people were probably in good hands, I answer with a double meaning. There are other reasons for it if you consider it carefully. He overrides my ironical answer. For sure, I confirm the truth of his accusation. In the last days, many wounded arrived in Paris so that the authorities were forced to transfer those who could be transported. So it's good, you can go. The next, please. What funny people are here, I think, while a medic accompanies me to my bed. In the room there is a feeling of oppression. I have hardly made myself comfortable when I hear a soldier speaking to one of the SS medics. Yes, sir he says. Stop all that nonsense. Suddenly I lose my senses and hop to the sergeant as though driven by an inner force. I am Sergeant Horner. I hiss to take the man aback. And I want to ask you what you mean with this tone of voice. This comrade has stood as a man, and if you want to risk everything like him, then I suggest that you go smell where fourteen days ago he spit. The front is waiting for big mouths like you. Slowly my inner equilibrium returns. 
Ice cold, I observe the man across from me. He has turned red with rage, but he controls himself, turns around and leaves. At the moment you could hear a pin drop in the hall. Satisfied, I hop back to my place, surprised at the fuss the others make about my action. You certainly shut his trap, a soldier in the neighbouring bed says. Hopefully it will do some good. I can't stand to see how they try to jump all over us, I say, relieved, and climb into my bed. He will report you for sure, the man fears. He can go right ahead. I can handle myself, I answer indifferently. If we win the war, can't you just imagine how they will act? He wrinkles his forehead with these dark forebodings. We aren't that far yet, so that L have to worry about it. If it comes to that, we are all still here, I indicate as lunch is carried in. In any case, enjoy the food. I guide him back from the future to the present and consider with light resistance the rubber-like macaroni in the grey broth. Don't they have anything else to eat here than these disgusting ringworms? The confidence of the men in the room awakens slowly. They can smear this filthy mutton in their hair. The courageous soldiers take up their well-practised complaining, although the most outspoken, as always, are already after seconds. The mealtime is flavoured with an ongoing humorous banter, until the entire crowd has eaten themselves full and rack out in the beds to fall asleep.